So I am John Monroe. I am 24 from Scotland and I'm a sim racer, real life racer, uh, a commentator and content creator for Attraction GG. And we're here, I'm chatting with Bob Dan, who I've known for many, many years in sim racing, but never actually had the pleasure of meeting in person. And also, uh, another thing that I should add for John's credential is, is he's also a backpipe singer and a singer overall. Oh, that's a, uh, not quite, not quite. I did actually do, I did a bit of singing. I did a bit of singing years ago for a Scottish trad uh, traditional music band, but that is, that is a long time ago now. Yes, well, I have a, vi a video. But... Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know those existed. But you have like a bagpipe, but then you're playing on some sort of like drum for me. To, what's that called? Yeah, so it's a cajon. So basically, it's um, it's like a box you sit on, essentially, isn't it? So you've got a uh, you've got bass down low, and then you've got a snare up high in the box, and you just sit on it and you just hit it and play bass or snare, depending on what you're doing. And and um, yeah, it's a big part of. To be honest, it was a big part of my childhood, like. I played a lot of music in school and was part of a lot of different music groups and that like music and racing were both kind of my things when I was growing up. So it's weird because I don't do it very much anymore, but I've still got the cajon in the living room and it sits there and kind of acts like a coffee table, which is quite nice, but I just don't really have the chance to play it anymore, which is a shame. Okay. And do you also sing like voice? <sighs> no. So, so I did. Um, when, when I was in this, so I was basically in the Scottish Youth Cayley Band, where basically you get a bunch of traditional Scottish musicians and you audition to get into this group and you play a lot of old Scottish traditional music together and you do concerts and stuff like that. So I got into this group um, when I was in my third or fourth year of school and I was playing the drums in it. But then as it went on, we also had some songs as well where I ended up being the singer as well. So essentially, I didn't really go into it meaning to be to do singing, but in the last few years, we had a couple of songs and I was given the part to do the singing. So um, I did a little bit of that, but it's really strange because it's a very small part of my life. So I would never say I was a singer and I'm a terrible singer, by the way, now especially, like I could never sing, but it was, uh, it was a nice thing to be part of. Like I did, I did really enjoy it. But you, you clearly missed your like uh, career opportunity because now Britain's got talent, Ed Sheeran, you clearly did it. I didn't, have talent. Also, I didn't have enough talent. There are a lot of people out there that are famous and don't have talent, so... <laughs> You're not wrong. You're definitely not wrong. <laughs> okay, my first question, and uh, kind of you're like a little bit of an experiment, because I, I did this kind of podcast on the Romanian scene, but I uh, I kind of ran out of, out of names, and I said, okay, on the, uh, like on the English international side, I have a lot more, not interesting people, but a lot more people that I want to talk with, like general talk. So I like revamped some stuff. And my first question here is, what's the point? What's the point? Yes. Of whatever you think we're talking about here, real life, sim racing, motorsport, whatever. What's the point? Why, why do we do it? Oh, these kind of things. Well, oh man, it's just, it's just enjoyment, isn't it? It's it, like, for, so. For me, if you look at all the things I've enjoyed doing, so the music and obviously a lot of stuff revolves around racing and sim racing, it's a lot about like being part of a community and being good at something you can enjoy with other people. So for me, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's life wouldn't be the same without those kind of things, I think. You know, I, I need to have something fun to look forward to at the end of the week, at the end of the month. And I've always been someone who goes and tries to do as many things as possible. And I'm also someone that when I'm passionate about something, I get very passionate about it, like overly passionate about it. So I don't know if, if it's something that I enjoy doing and it helps me become part of a community and I get to know friends through it. For me, those are the best things in life. So that happened with music when I was young, like playing in these groups. I got to know so many friends through there that kind of got me away from the school environment and made me get to know people on a totally different level outside of the kind of, you know, you, you get you get to know people in school based on being with them every day and you get put in certain groups and stuff like that. And I'm from quite a small place in the Highlands. So for me, it's just being able to get out and be part of a bigger community where you can just be yourself and fully open and be passionate about stuff and share that passion with other people. I think that's probably where it stems from, to be honest. But aside from that, with, with racing specifically, 
it just stems from the fact that I've always absolutely loved cars and motorsport and anything I can do involving that is, is going to be good fun for me. So I will try and get involved in as much as possible with it. Right. And also, does the racing part come, singing and racing part come from the family, like father, mother? Um, so the music probably comes from my mum because she, she used to play violin when she was younger, but then she stopped doing it. And then, then we picked it up as kids. So my dad's terrible. He, he's not a musician at all or a singer. He's the worst. Um, but then me and my sister both started playing music when we were younger. And, and my mum actually got back into music, having been in it when she was younger and then taking a break. She got back into it when we did. So it definitely comes from her side, I would say, for the music. Uh, and the racing definitely comes from my dad's side because he was racing when I was growing up. Um, I'm actually more, I would say I'm more like of a motorsport nerd than he is. Like I, I will watch more racing on TV than he does. He still enjoys the odd event on the weekend, but I've like always been a passionate F1 viewer and I watch every kind of motorsport I could, especially growing up. But it definitely comes from my dad because he tried everything he could when he was in his 20s and 30s to try and buy a car to go and compete. And then that's obviously how I was able to get into motor racing in the first place because he had a car, he was at events, so then I could go along. And those were like some of the most fun weekends in my childhood going and watching him. So yeah, I'd say music from my mum, racing from my dad. And I should also mention on that question as well, Bogdan, my mum started racing as well a couple of years ago because she was so tired of, I think she was tired of being at these events and not feeling like she was being able to take part and she likes a challenge. So she thought, you know what, let's, let's give it a go as well. So she got a Nissan 350Z and um, started racing herself. And she's honestly, she's doing a good job. Like now she's really beginning to get the hang of it and you can see her like taking proper racing lines and getting more brave. And she's beginning to like be competitive in her class against other cars. So um, yeah, it's a bit of, it's definitely a whole family thing now, isn't it? Good job, mom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well done. Uh, yeah, yeah. On, on the racing side, uh, me, I presume that that's always like father something. Who is faster? Did you manage to get like similar cars on the same track, same day to see like, okay, you're faster, he's faster, or like just the competition side between you two? Yeah, it, so the, the racing that he's always done was hill climbing and sprints. So essentially you're not racing against each other on circuit, you're racing against the clock and you're both in the same car. Uh, so it's the, the ultimate test of who's faster because you can both jump in the same car on the same circuit on the same day and do a time and you know you can't really complain the only thing you could say is oh my tires were you know i warmed the tires for you or, or i wore the tires out for you whichever if you're losing or winning that's how you go <laughs> but the, the funny thing was when when we started um the idea was that my dad was he had a single seater so like a formula three formula four style type of car but hill climb specific so a lot lighter a bike engine 150 horsepower so it's very very quick but when i would turn 16 he was going to throw me in uh, a much slower car, like a hatchback, like a Citroen Saxo. We actually bought a Citroen Saxo so that I could learn slowly and not just jump straight into a single seater race car when I hadn't done any kart racing or anything like that. So, so either way, we, we bought this Citroen Saxo. It was too rusty to pass an MOT. So we ended up not being able to use it. And because of that, we had to use the single seater. And my dad was saying to me, like, he obviously was really, I'd be doing some racing. So he knew I would be knowledgeable about racing and somewhat had a chance of being good. But he, he said to me, if you beat me on my, on my, if you beat me on your first ever event, I will retire. That's what he said to me on the way. Cause he was like, I've been oh, doing shit. it. He's, 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 I've been doing it for, uh, at that point he'd been doing it for well, almost 20 years. And he said, if you beat me on my first event, like I'll retire. So we went to Croft, which was a, a British sprint championship round. But Croft was a, a proper circuit so that you could race on the Sims and stuff. And he'd never been to Croft. And I knew Croft from, from the Sims. So I actually did beat him in the first round and uh, won my class. But he was saying, well, that doesn't really count because you know the track. I don't, you know. And I was like, oh, that's fair. That's fair. So then we went to a Scottish event that, that's not on any Sims. So a track I'd never driven around, a track he'd driven around a lot and he'd won events at. And he said, right, but now this is like, this is the proper test now because, you know, you've never been here. I've been here a lot. Let's see how you get on. And I ended up winning overall. Um, and so he, he basically at that point, that became a running joke because he obviously didn't retire because why would he? But he just did not <laughs> expect it straight away. Um, and neither did I, of course. So that's always a funny story he tells because, um, 
yeah, like literally, if you beat me, I will retire. And then I, I beat everyone and won the whole event. And, and he's like, well, okay, that was a surprise, but there's no way in hell I'm retiring now. So since then, we've always raced together, but he, I've always had the edge in him, let's put it that way. He's almost beaten me a few times, but I don't think without like mechanical issues or, or, or other things at play, when we're just neck and neck and we both get the same amount of runs, he's been close, but he's never quite managed to do it. But I feel for you that I have a son now and it's like, oh, I'm not going to ever, ever let him in. <laughs> like we yeah. play games now and like the mom expects, expects me to let the child win. I'm like, no, what? no, what? don't do it. No, no. So this is the thing, right? I grew up like with that attitude. So my dad would never, ever let me win or go easy on. OK, maybe if we're playing football, he's not going to kick me as hard as a professional. Right. But he would never, ever go easy on me and never, ever let me win anything because he knew that that would mean that when I did win, I would enjoy it and deserve it. So we used to always play like pool and snooker when we would go on holiday. And he was always better than me, but I always really wanted to play him because I wanted to beat him. So we probably played like 200, 300 games of pool over the years and he never lost. He won every single game. But <laughs> the first time I beat him, when he potted the black, and I actually, or the first time I beat him on merit actually, when, when he, you know, it wasn't like a, a one-off fluke. It was such a big moment for me because I was like, right, you've never gone easy on me and I finally won. And I loved that, like growing up. I never, I never, I would have hated it if if he'd let me win and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I'm on, I'm on your side. Like never, ne like you go easy to a degree, but never let a child win because then they just think that that's how it should be, and then they get they could complain when it's not the case. But no, absolutely not. Okay, so th those are some fantastic memories, but we'll come back to some of them. Let's back to the let's get back to the current stuff. Ah. Uh, Present us what thing you do you have? Because you, in theory, you have like two, two, gear, two sim racing gears. Because you have one at the office, I presume, and what? What the hell? Yeah, yeah. So I, so this is the thing. We've got amazing equipment at the office. And um, so we've all got, right. we've got we because we work with Fanatec and Thrustmaster and Next Level. So we get all these fancy rigs, direct drive wheels, and we review them, test them. But I do not have the spare income to spend on fancy equipment at the moment. So. I have a Logitech G29 and I race on the desk I'm sitting at right now and it's just clamped on here and I've got my pedals pressed up against the wall. So I've got my foot in the pedals right now. Um, but that's that's what I've always ran with at home. Um, I used to run with a G27 as well, which you will remember. Uh, yeah. Driving Force GT, all that stuff. Love those wheels, but I've, I've never been in a position to go out and spend more money on a nice wheel just because there's always been other things that I need to save for are more important. So. But honestly, it does the job. It really does. Right, but then my question becomes redundant because I was going to ask you, hey, does sim gear help you or not? Well, clearly you play plenty fast with the no. GT designs. <laughs> it does, it does, it definitely does. Like we, we're spoiled at work. So we get, to, as you know, we get to try all of the best stuff. And every day I'm making videos using different direct drive wheels and for, you know, load cell pedals and all these things. It genuinely does make a difference, but not, in the same way that people might expect if they're not into it. Like I find you can be very quick on a Logitech. Like I've raced in SRO and been competitive enough on a Logitech, but you always feel like you could have more. So I just don't quite have the feedback. Like when the rain comes and you're feeling for every little bit of grip, that's when it makes a difference. Um, eye racing uh, under brakes, for example, having the Logitech pedals really doesn't help on eye racing because it's so difficult not to lock up. So when you when you drive, I don't really race on iRacing for that reason. So if I had better equipment, maybe I would give it a go. But yeah, with the current equipment, I can't justify it because I know I would be better if I had better equipment. So it, it's a balance. Like you don't you don't need a fancy wheel to be fast, but the fancy equipment definitely helps at a high level get you that little bit extra and and become better at more different sims. So yeah, it's even though I don't have the fancy equipment, I do think it makes a difference. Right, but in, in my mind, it's like, I think that it makes a difference, but it makes a difference like uh, in terms of hours of practice. Like if you put like 10,000 hours in G29, you can be as fast as almost anybody. But then if you have like a DD, you don't have to put 10,000 hours. You have to put like 1,000 or something like that. For me, yeah. in, in my mind, that's the difference that it makes. It's not that a DD is going to gain you like 0 0.3 a lap. It's going to... Yeah, yeah help you manage the car better, but not speed-wise. Just comfortable, fun, and less practice, in my mind. No, that, that's a, I totally agree. Like, um, consistency is way easier. So, so 
when you use like a Logitech or a cheaper wheel, you have to learn, you don't, you don't learn to feel everything the car is doing and react live. You have to learn a pre-programmed way of driving. So, so because the wheel doesn't give you all the feedback, you need to learn exactly when to turn in, how much the car needs to move to be fast. So it does take a lot of practice and it makes you less consistent because if you don't quite get the right marks, you, you can't really adapt as easily. Whereas when you jump on direct drive and everything, because you, because you feel everything through the wheel all the time, you can actually react a bit more to what's going on around you and you can drive more on feel rather than almost like, as you say, you have to get dialed into the Logitech. Like when I'm, when I'm racing with the Logitech, I'm not thinking I'm going to adjust my things based on what I feel through the wheel. I'm thinking like I need to learn how to be fast and then just like almost tell your brain to ignore the force feedback, ignore the lack of feeling and just do it because that is the best way. So no, that, that is a very good point. Um, uh, yeah, I totally agree. So if if we have a scoreboard, let's say from now until the fancy, hmm, again, this scoreboard is like, is it better to race or is it better to wait for a more fancy equipment? Ooh, um, I reckon just put in the time. That's for me. Like, if you think about it this way as well, the, the, this, the, the ceiling of performance, like the maximum lap time or the best lap time you could possibly do, isn't affected by the wheel because because it's affected by the sim and the physics and all the wheel does is translate feeling to you so i think that you're always going to learn the more laps you put in the more you're going to learn first of all I, I think the better equipment comes in handy once you've got the basics like if you're already getting the basics and you're within a couple of seconds then sure you know less practice but better equipment would help you out but i think until you're at that point it's always going to be more practice and getting to know what you've actually got because as i say there's nothing, there's nothing physically stopping you doing the lap times of James Baldwin or, or the top SRO guys. It's, it's just, you just don't feel the same things to be able to get there, if that makes sense. Right, so practice one, gear zero. I yeah, I'd say, so. I'd say so, I'd say so. I, I, to, a, to a point, yes. Yeah. Like, until course. you get very high level, yeah, yeah. Uh, being in your position, which part do you enjoy the most? Because you have been like a proper sim racer. A commentator, some sort of organizer, if not more serious, of that I know. You're a real life racer, back by singer and overall singer. Of <laughs> <laughs> so, which of these, all of the aspects, is like the not the most important, but the one that you enjoy the most. No, oh, that's so difficult. That's so difficult. It's, it's honestly, it's something I've never, I've never sat down and really thought about what I enjoy the most. What I would say is if I had the opportunity of doing a sim race and a real event at the weekend, I would almost always pick the real event. But there does come a time where if you're doing lots of real stuff, you, you've, sometimes it can get quite tiring, especially if you, the stuff you're doing is extra to what you need to do. So for me, it's been a, it's been a strange one because I've, I've done Scottish at hill climbing and sprinting throughout when I started racing and that's all I did um, and some British stuff but then very quickly I moved on to circuit racing um, after the first season when it went really well in sprints it was like right let's try and you know go proper circuit racing so that was traveling down to England and doing all that stuff so ever since then I've kind of done full season campaigns in a championship so I would never ever miss like a round of for example the club enduro championship which is what I'm doing right now in real life I wouldn't miss a round of that for any sim race or anything unless I was had the chance to win you know a million a million pounds or something where it might be worth doing but that's not never the case I I would pick the real race but if it gets to a point where I've got lots of extra events that I could do so for example maybe there's a Scottish sprint event that I could do but it's 500 miles away and I'd, and I'd be missing a round of like SRO and um, with Jota then in that situation maybe I pick the sim racing for the opportunities but it it's it's a tricky one it's, it's something you can't I can't physically answer because I really enjoy all these different things and I find it really difficult to like quantify them and decide which I enjoy more but I mean based on based on what do I look forward to the most it's got to be real racing like now that I've now that I'm down south living in England and I'm more local to the circuits I put a lot into that and I've not really done much sim racing at all like since since I did SRO last season um, I've barely done any sim racing at all outside of work just because there's been so much on and I would say that it's been okay I don't feel like I, I absolutely need it right now I'm happy to just focus on the real racing and my job whereas if I was missing out in the real racing uh, I would maybe you know feel like I really needed that back in my life a bit more because sim racing is in some ways is more stressful and more difficult right because for sim racing 
you, you spend days and evenings practicing Holy and you need you need to practice to be on on the pace so you, you you'd be like oh i don't have much time this week but i need to practice if i want to be competitive and i'm racing for a good team i'm representing my teammates i can't let them down i don't want to let people down and you jump in and it's ultra competitive when i'm doing circuit racing you turn up at the weekend and you do as well as you can and everyone's in the same boat so there's actually a lot less pressure on it because you just turn up drive try and win have a lovely time go home it's not like you're racing at a very elite level where every result there's super pressure on it and loads of practice needed so in some ways that's weirdly easier to cope with as well okay and um, but you haven't mentioned nothing about well the bike bike of course but commentary so I, i love commentating as well um i've actually i've turned down real events to to do the commentary before as well um i just just because whether it's uh, someone was needing needing a commentator and i was available and i wanted to try and focus more on career that's probably why um over the years like when i was growing up i knew i could never be a professional racing driver or at least i, I realized very quickly when we went circuit racing that it's all about money and when i won a championship in 2016 we had to sell the car straight after so we couldn't you know it's not like oh you win a championship and you get an opportunity it's oh you win a championship congratulations now pay us the same money again and you can try and do it next year So, so we learned that and I, we ended up having to sell the car and take a season out. So from that point onwards, commentary was more something that I loved in, in a very similar way with less adrenaline, but actually something that I could tangibly say, well, maybe there's a career in, in media and motorsport media. And I mean, it kind of worked out because I'm now working for Traction, making videos and I'm doing commentary for Traction as well. So I am actually getting paid to commentate on sim racing and I've been paid in the past to commentate on, on the British Hill Climb Championship. So that too. So the, the commentary is a different thing to racing, but I love it. I love it in a different way and I love it a lot, but it actually feels a little bit more tangible as it's leading towards something. So if you get a good opportunity, you don't really want to miss it. Right. How does the work uh, um, ha happens at Traction? Like, do you come up with ideas or like some other people come with ideas and you're like just the host or like, and the, after you finished your review or like the video that you have, does it go to like a like a producer or something that okay this shouldn't be here this should be here this we cut this we don't cut it's not it's not too bad to be honest it's not it's essentially with traction um i was there since before it launched so i was i was like the first kind of full-time traction focused creator and at that point um i didn't even know what traction was going to be called Um, I didn't know what my job role would be. I just knew that I was someone who was passionate about racing, was happy to do different things and try and learn. So, um, you know, when I started, Traction was was kind of almost creating itself based on the people. So we worked out the things that worked for us. So I wrote some videos um, I I did some live style videos where i just did something and recorded me doing it so it was all it all came from me but there was also like other ideas were thrown into the pot by the people i was working with like the management who had kind of brought me in so it was a combination of those things and at first it was definitely getting vetted so i would maybe send a video um and then i would get feedback and it would be this is this is rubbish this is great but change this change that and i look back now and i think oh my goodness why did i send stuff with those mistakes in it? but as time's gone on and i've kind of attractions grown um obviously from nothing to what it is now and i've i've kind of taken uh one of the kind of lead roles in that and on the video side it's become a lot more just you know they have confidence in us so we do what we want to do so if, if we have a passion project a video we really want to make we go and make it nothing really gets vetted unless it's unless it's like i say a sponsor style video so you're maybe making a video for a company and they want to see a draft of it to make sure that it's okay and they're happy with it Um, but no, generally speaking, our video, like we, there's enough trust in us as a team that we will make the videos we think are appropriate. We take the lead. So a lot of the videos I'll write myself and then record, or we'll take uh, articles that have been written by our editorial team who are amazing and turn them into videos as well. And we, we just have, we just trust ourselves in that sense. We, if we make a mistake in the video, it's on us. Um, but generally speaking, the, we're at a good enough level now where the quality is okay. So it's very relaxed, which is lovely. It doesn't feel like we're being micromanaged you know it's essentially like go out have fun make the videos you want to make and uh and if that's working then great awesome well i have like two questions at one when you say you're writing for the video are you making like a proper script and then you're reading out of a prompter or just just bullet points and then you talk off the bullet points and you make the content out of those honestly it's a complete mixture um so generally speaking we don't really do bullet points so i would i would use bullet points if i was doing like a live style video so say 
there's a video where I'm playing a game and my, I've got a, my face is in the video and it's happening live. So I'm talking as I'm driving, as I'm recording. Then I might use bullet points to, for my intro. So here, here, you know, we're making, say you're making a video about a new update on Gran Turismo 7. I remember to make, you know, I'll make a bullet point saying, say hello, mention or introduction, uh, update number. So version 1.15, uh, three cars and two new tracks. Uh, I'm excited to try it. You know, whatever my like hit the points I want to hit, basically, I'll make I'll make bullet points and do. Um, but the the kind of voiceover editorial style videos, like our reviews, um, any of the stuff that's a little bit more like my guides and stuff like that. So racecraft guides and track guides, they're fully scripted. So they'll essentially just be voiced over in the in the booth with a full script, no bullet points. And it requires a totally different style of presenting, and it's really strange to kind of keep both things natural but but they're very different um and then also that applies to piece to camera videos as well so say we're doing a review where i'm talking to a camera um but the, the i'm not doing something else in the video i'm just talking then again that'll be scripted but it won't we don't use a prompt or we haven't used a prompt in the past so that it literally is memorizing so I'll, I'll read a couple of sentences memorize a couple of sentences and then deliver it and then take a break read read the next few deliver it again, maybe it takes three or four attempts, and then you just cut it in a way that it's natural. Um, so it might be cutting away to other videos or, you know, zooming in the camera so that it doesn't look, you know, stagnant. So it, honestly, it's a complete mixture. And we do have a teleprompter for scripts, which we're going to start using soon, um, which will make it a lot quicker and the process a lot less stressful trying to memorize things, um, but never used it to this date so far. So ho hopefully it looks natural. Like you can tell me more than I know, because when I'm editing the videos, it's so hard to know how they're actually being perceived? No, like it, it looks very well. And uh, I was in my mind, because I watch a lot of YouTube content, I was like, maybe this is not fully scripted, like to the line. It's it, it's scripted, but not to the line. But you tell me like now it's like to the line. As I was expecting to have like a prompter. But kudos to you. Like, <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's hard though that because doing it without a prompter, but scripted, you almost you're almost like delivering it through memory, which makes it harder to be natural because instead of being able to just chat about something, you're like speaking and you're trying to remember what was the next bit. And it's like, you almost break it into parts. You're like, this sentence is three parts. It's the, the first part of the sentence, um, the, the, the catchy phrase, and then the, the finale to the sentence. You're, you're trying to memorize it as you go. And sometimes it, I feel like I come across a bit robotic, but that's, that's a mixture of lack of experience and, and also just being comfortable with it. But it's um it's difficult and i think sometimes you, ha you obviously have to allow yourself to improvise a little bit you know and and yeah. you're never going to say it exactly but as long as you say the right thing that you want to say that's the main thing i have done one video which was like a, almost a piece to camera style script but i did it on bullet points and it was a video about the things i loved about gran turismo 7. so it was an editorial style vi video where i'd written all the things i wanted to say but instead I'd done it as like very broad bullet points. So like talk about why I love the content. And then I would, I will just go on a ramble for like 40 seconds. I might have to repeat it, but that I really enjoyed that because that felt a lot more natural. I didn't feel like it was scripted and I was a robot doing it, but actually it, it, it because it, because I was hitting predetermined points, it still followed the script I needed it to follow. So it wasn't, it wasn't sloppy. It still sounded good. So that was what I really enjoyed doing. And that was actually a mixture of both things, but I've only done that once weirdly enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. But now, and you know, I, I ask this question a lot, and I know this is like a very niche, and it's like a just for me because I don't know, I'm old uh, in sim racing and also semi old in real life. Is like, and I'm so very pretentious because I love sim racing, it's my passion. And I don't have uh, the opportunity to race in real life except with my truck. I don't know, I drive very slow with my truck. So I see like there's no perfect sim. We can agree on that. Like every sim has like something, either a bug, a trick, something. Something's like, and the examples that uh, I'm gonna give now, uh, Mihai uh, Negi is gonna hate me for this, but race room is kind of dying or dead, or like something like that. Uh, so in race room you don't have, uh, you have temp, you don't have any temperature, you don't have like no, no weather variation. I'm not gonna say rain, cause holy shit, that's, <laughs> So race on that, but in race on they had like the brand championship, DTM, VTCC, uh, ADAC. Now we'll see if they have them, I don't know. ACC, the thing that annoys me the most as a driver is one, the warping, which 
for some people it happens, for some don't, and the break technique, which I still don't understand. But I'm a noob, so it's okay. And then I think you have net code, expensive, and, and then you have Air Factor 2, which there are some good champions in there, but oh my god, you need like a big desire to, to play that game. You need like a big heart to play. And then the like uh, unfor like the forgotten child automobilista, which I love immensely. Like AMS is so great. Anyway, none of the YouTube channels, simulating YouTube channels that I look, you and other names that do simulation content, don't speak of, about the bad things. A lot of bad things, but those tricks, tips, or like issues like the minimum tire pressures in racing, or like last season it was in ACC, like Max Camber minimum toy in or some some stuff like that. That that was the trick. And I'm like, is because we all all of us try to be positive. Why nobody's talking about it except Austin Ogonowski. I Austin, but no, why? It's not good yeah. content because I understand you need to make content and people to watch it and everything. And I presume you don't want to be controversial, but still I'm like, but you still want to tell the truth. And I'm like, how is it? It's, it's tricky. I can't speak on behalf of other people. So I can only say like what my perception is like. And I've only been making racing game videos for, you know, a year and a half now. So I'm not, I'm not someone who's been making videos for five or six years. And um, I'm still someone who's quite new to it. And honestly, like in general and same in life, I'm not a confrontational person. I don't, I'm not a negative person. I tend to be quite, I'm, I can be annoyingly positive at times. And I think that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. That can be a, a bad thing. But when it comes to sim racing, like, and I, when I'm enjoying doing something in a video, I'm going to focus on that and make sure it's clear because at the end of the day, like the whole thing with, with making racing game videos is I'm really enjoying playing the game and I want people watching to enjoy watching, but also potentially pick up the game and play themselves because I want to bring joy to sim racing because that's what I have. So when I enjoy a game, I want other people to be able to enjoy it. And I, I, and I like celebrating the things people do well, because I think like, I don't know any perfect game. Like there, almost every game you talk about FIFA, Call of Duty, all the big ones, they're all hugely flawed at the same time. And people complain about them constantly and people still love playing them. And yet yeah, there is definitely a space for negativity or for people to be critical. That's obviously a big thing. And I think in our in our more serious editorial content, like reviews and stuff like that, I, there is, of course, always the critical element. So we will be critical in the things we can pick up on. And um, I say we is a, I've not really done many full game reviews. It tends to be our written team, but they do a really good job on being critical where they need to be and being honest about stuff. And, you know, the, the kind of thing you would expect from someone who's doing a professional job of a review. But when I'm playing these games, I, I tend to fo try and play games that I enjoy playing. I try and do things on those games that I like, and I try and bring positivity. So if I'm enjoying something, I'll say it. If I'm finding something a bit disappointing in a video, I, I tend to say, I tend to try and balance it and be like, well, I'm not sure about this, but, you know, here we are. Because I think that, you know, I've done a few videos where I've not necessarily enjoyed what I'm doing that much or just thought, you know what, this game isn't for me or this isn't a thing. And, and I feel rubbish after it. So we'll put a video out and I'll feel I'm waiting for comments to come in being like, Oh, you, you, you weren't getting the best out of this game. You don't know what you're doing. And, and those kind of things I struggle with. So I do, because I'm like, I feel like I haven't put my heart into that video because I seem like I'm down about it. But actually the truth is I just didn't necessarily enjoy playing it that much in that specific video. Um, so it, it's tricky because you do get people on YouTube that are very critical of things and we'll, we'll talk about the problems in games, but, I, that's not really my thing. On a personal style level, I would rather just come in and talk about what video games do well and celebrate the good things and, okay, acknowledge the bad things if they need to be acknowledged, but I'd rather just say, well, instead of focusing on what they're doing wrong, why don't you go and play this game because they're doing this right? Right, fair enough. I think I came up, uh, I attacked it wrong. Like, what I was saying is, like, when when you guys do it, and not you, not you, I'm talking with you, but I'm talking in general overall. It's yeah. like, Because the guy, in, uh, the guys in Australia, uh, YouTube channel. Ah, oh, shit, I forgot. Boosted Media. So when they review something, they actually like they say, okay, we have ten positive things. To ah, they can work on it. And on a lot of game reviews or car reviews or something, I don't see that. But maybe it's some um, my vision is skill. Anyway, moving on from this, what's the plan with the real life racing compared if you have like the time? to be a paid pro esport driver. 
like mm -hmm. I don't know big championships. Like you said, real life is expensive. Do you see yourself? Okay, now I'm racing this season with Miata and uh, stuff. Do I see myself? Okay, I need to go up a level or like up, 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 up. Do you see having the potential to do that or like you're gonna have like a for for the real racing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. I realized quite. I realized quite young. I talked about this earlier. That I, it's very difficult to make a career. You need to get sponsors on board. Even then, to act, that's just to to be able to pay for it. But to make a career, you need to be signed by a manufacturer who are willing to spend money on a contract on you. And it's not many people are in that position. Or you get paid by a big sponsor who will give you a wage as well as paying for the seat or or whatever the arrangement might be. So. I kind of I, I accepted it young and basically ever since then I've just been really grateful to do anything so doing like club enduro in an MX5 of course I would love to be having a shot of British GT or going to Le Mans or doing British touring cars but at the end of the day I would rather do 20 sustainable years in a in a lower spec championship that's more affordable than doing one season in a high spec championship where I'm really stressed about um, pleasing my sponsors, doing you know, doing a great job in the race. Oh, I've 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 let myself down here. I've not done a great race. Are the sponsors going to be angsty? Are they going to be hoping for more? There's pressures that come with that that I wouldn't necessarily enjoy. And honestly, I would much rather take sustainable motorsport where I could actually just race cars for fun and not worry about it too much over a year or two of stressing. And I've seen it with a lot of young drivers where they they're fully career focused, which I understand. And they they go up through the ladder, they go up through the ranks, and they race in higher series. But they're always at the end of the year struggling to get the money to be back on the grid or to move up. And it, okay, it's great. Like a lot of them, it pays off in some ways, and they end up in big series. You know, whether that's Porsches or you know GT cars or anything. But it's so hard to sustain because then you know you do a year in that, you're continuing to progress, you're getting good results, and then you get to the end of the year and with this time, I don't get the money together. And suddenly it's like you've failed. Your career is at a point, you've been doing well, and then you're off the grid the next season. And at that point in your head, you're thinking, I had something good and I've lost it and it's, it's not as good anymore. And it's going to be hard to get it back. And you're going to struggle to, to take yourself down, you know, three career steps, for example, just to be racing. You don't want to see yourself going from racing in GT3 cars to suddenly racing in, you know, scrap old hatchbacks in a club level championship you know what i mean so so it's a balance for me and i think great the people that do that and have a few good seasons it's awesome people that sustain it well done even better but i've never seen that as a realistic possibility unless a sponsor or someone comes along and i can give them value so if they if they want to spend money on me to go racing with their logos on the car and i can do something for them then i'm perfectly happy to do that and i would love to do that but realistically so many good racing drivers never even get the chance to, to drive a race car or be on a racetrack. So I get to go racing every year in a sustainable fashion, which so many people don't. I, I just love every minute and that's all I can focus on. And if opportunities come up in the future, amazing, but I, I would rather just focus on what I'm doing. And if it leads to anything good, then great. All right. And then comparing that, make a parallel with like, if you had the time or the chance, uh, it, to be like a pro, you, you already were like with Jota, like a pro sport driver, but like getting paid, uh, like, I don't know, uh, for me, like a dream, even though if I don't like the decision is, and I don't agree with it because I'm a former athlete and like, similarly, it is a sport, but it's not like a sport. So I understand that, and, but it is what it is. I didn't make the decision. And also I don't agree with like Gran Turismo, but I presume they, they have the most people. So I, uh, but for me, it would be like, oh my God, to go to the Olympics because I was an athlete and I know I like, I, I watch track and field and Usain Bolt. So I'm like, man, to go to the Olympics, how oh shit, that would be so amazing. So are, are you, do you have that in your mind or for you? Like, because you have real life pro esports is like, kind of like, second or third down yeah i think well, first, first of all if, let's take it realistically for a start i i'm not quite good enough and don't have the the time and the the commitment ability to go and be a, a high level professional esports driver so yeah i could hold my own in a high level field I'm, I'm a decent driver i'm a good driver but if you know if i do as best as i can and put all the effort in with a really good team 
I'm not going to be right at the top. I might just make, I might make the top league. You know, I might make it to the final or whatever. But I, I, that's me being realistic. So therefore, in reality, no, I never go chasing it because I see how much time and effort really talented people put in to to be on the cusp of of success in terms of okay, prize money. You know, getting into the top five, getting in the top three. Um, incredible people miss out on those things because it's so competitive, and it's essentially more than a full time job if you want to do it well, because there's no limitations. Like if you want to win the top level esports event, there's no one stopping your competitor doing 14 hours of practice a day. There's no law to say you can only work nine hours a day and you can, you know, you have to take an hour lunch break. And, you know, it doesn't work like that. It's who, if you have the time to put in the practice and commitment, you keep someone will. So therefore you've got to do as much as possible all the time. And it, and it's not a guaranteed thing. You know, you can, you can get taken out. You can have an internet drop. You can just struggle for pace. So, realistically never you know for a while it was maybe a thing where if i can get myself in a team and it might lead to being paid it could be a great thing on the side but never ever have i seen myself as being in a position to actually go professional in esports and focus on it and um, i i love being in the position i am now where i get to in a professional manner enjoy the, the same things enjoy the games enjoy talking about the games playing the games commentating on these races without any of that stress and pressure and and that's my career and that's make a living out of so i can actually just go and enjoy my racing without the same levels of pressure so no um even hypothetically if i was that good if i was if i was right at the top level you know if i was your your bonos or your wheat belts or your siggies or these kind of people um with all the time in the world may, maybe i would consider it but um it's a lot of sacrifice and i've got a lot of other interests in my life uh, i'm a busy person so I, I would really struggle to put absolutely everything into that basket. I'm going to make a small shout out here. Hey, Michel, did you hear that? Redwild, yeah, he's fast. I have this Romanian guy, race room, top, di top division in race room. And when Redwild joined the race room, I said, Michel, watch for this guy, because I know him from back. He's like insane. And he, I presume he didn't like race room. He wasn't that insane. And then Michel keep trash talking back to me. Hey, he said he's insane. He's like, man, shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, like people are different on different sims, right? And it takes time to adapt. But yeah, like Reetveld is incredible. I, I remember when I joined Precision when he was there. And this is when I was young. I signed a big contract to join Precision Motorsport. And it was Keith Lee and, and uh, Sorensen, Kilov, Lauritsen, all these people, and Reetveld. And uh, it was just incredible. Like absolutely incredible. These guys were so fast consistently. And it might take time to jump. It's not easy to jump from one sim to another and be right at the top level, but give them a bit of time. He'll be on top of pretty much anything, you know? Yeah. So you, you mentioned, now I have to break as uh, the kill of Sorensen and Lauritsen. They will oh, they, of me. course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Those well, black cars menacing, menacing at the front of the grid. Yeah. yeah. There were some um, interesting times, let's see. <laughs> Honestly, oh, no, Turing Pro Series was incredible. I, I, that was it for me. That's where it all started being such a big passion. And that's where so many of my friends have come in this industry. Like, that's how I know so many people. And probably why I'm doing this now as a career is all because of how incredibly immersive Turing Pro Series was, not just as a race series, but as a community. Like, I, it, you felt like you were part of just this massive organization and this thing with with um, driver rankings and podcasts and races and teams and rivalries. It was amazing like beyond uh, like and i know i bug robert a lot and everybody around me but no offense to you or like lewis or stuff like that but for me the best commentary i heard was ryan carl <laughs> yeah and for Passionate. the love of god ryan come back like shit man like what the fuck is like no I, maybe it's like nostalgia yeah i enjoy the current com commentary a lot and but ryan has like Every time he did commentary, he had like certain words that he would like poems or stuff that he wanted to hit and he would insert them like random. And it's like, holy shit, where did that come? I don't know. I enjoyed it very, very, so, very much. So Ryan, come back already. It's funny you say that. Um, for me, the, one of the things that actually got me into Touring Pro Series, the first thing I ever heard about it before I joined, um, I was ill. I was very ill on holiday in Malta and all my family were out on the beach and wanted to go for a walk. And I was in the house unable to get off out of bed do anything i was really bored and i went on youtube a great site called youtube i recommend people should go and uh, try it out you might have heard of it um i went and found and, it, and something came up in my related stories and it was a it was a virtual clio series two and it was the first round at poznan 
uh, and and there was this guy called Keith Barrick in commentary with Danny Asbury, and you had William Levesque, you had um, at the top, you had so William Levesque, Toby Davis, Gary Lennon as well. Hi, Gary. Uh, all of these, and there, was, and there was just this incredible race. And honestly, I, can't, I remember it so vividly. Like, I remember where I was, what, how I was feeling. I was watching this race at Poznan, opening round of the season, and it was the best race I'd ever seen. There was like three of them. And I can't remember if that was the right three names in that battle, but those were kind of the guys at the front in, in general. And they were swapping positions, like every two corners, bump drafting, and it was just completely switching between them. And I remember watching, and I was a kid at the time, I was only uh, maybe 13 or something. And I remember watching this and thinking, these guys are like, these guys are celebrities. Like to me, the names, if I ever, I didn't know I'd ever get to speak to them, you know, that, that they were like pro racing drivers having this incredible battle. Keith Barrick with his book it and all that commentary, <laughs> the best ever. And I was thinking if I got in that series, how cool would it be to race in that broadcast with that much epicness and that much racing and that much gravitas and actually do it. And that is how I got into touring pro series because I, that the next season I was like, I need to find a way to get involved in this because if I can get into the top 10, and be part of that broadcast to me that was like i'm going to be on fate on tv like i'm going to be famous and be part of a race that's so exciting to watch um so yeah that that was an amazing memory for me and i'll never forget it honestly yeah pps for me and also race department man a lot a lot of memories and i know maybe we sound old now because but i don't know back in the day because it was more i don't know or more passionate i don't know, at least in our bubble the people were more passionate and they were yeah. willing to grind more where here's you on track and now you're like you get all of these people i'm like now I, I'm, I'm going on i racing and all of the people oh my god it cannot be two seconds fast and i'm like what the hell are you talking about i'm putting eight hours i yeah. need to you can fast like oh but it's not fair and i'm like what, the, what? <laughs> i i agree i agree i think i also think nowadays it, it feels quite I think it's because there's lots of money involved and there's professional teams and everything feels a little bit muted and a little bit serious. And, you know, it's like doing a job, you know, you win, that's the job I set out to do. And it's all about this. It's about, you know, continuing the work. And, and I feel like back in our day, it was like, it was like, we all just for that one minute or for that, sorry, for that like four hours on the weekend or on Wednesday evening when there was a broadcast, we all felt like we could be superheroes. Like we all felt like we could be celebrities in this race and like live the life of a pro driver. And the commentators were absolutely on it as well. But I remember you you taking pole at um, Lime Rock. That was the second. So so that was my first TPS season, the, the Virtual Clio 3, which after I'd watched the broadcast of Virtual Season 2. And I ended up with um, leading the first round um, at Snetterton, which for me was like, oh my goodness. I remember watching this last year, being so excited, and now I'm leading it and I'm in a broadcast. This is insane. And then the second round at Lime Rock, you got pole. And I remember your teammate, Alexander Rhodes, um had put in like a th one and a half thousand laps of practice or something and it was like because we used to have live racers didn't we told you exactly how many laps everyone had done and at that point everyone was just so passionate about getting to the front and having a good battle and i i totally agree with you it's, it feels a little bit more corporate now but that's probably because it's a bigger thing now and there's more people involved and there's more money in it but back then it was like here's just a fun community having you know as you, as you say trying to have their moment you know yeah my greatest memory, and I'm going to brag about it, is like, uh, I think, uh, 2016 race room, and it was Ryan and Danny on, on the Nürburgring, and I was like top five, top ten with like Kunze, Dorni, then all of that in the Lada. And Sabanki as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, who do I pass? Learner, Learner as well. Uh, in everyone Lada. was there. Wiese Miller. Yeah. Robert. Just one of my former drivers in uh, in the last corner, and then he said, "Oh, Mr. Mr. C needs to be tested for uh, drugs or something like that." That was like the moment for me. Was like, yeah, that's my moment then, and I had like a few far in between, but that I don't. It was amazing. Anyway, let's go for some fun stuff now. Yeah, I could sit by the way and talk about touring pro series with you for like three hours, but we're not going to yeah, do yeah, that. But yeah. we could definitely. Definitely. One more memory I'm going to say, and put a link in the description. Please go watch Toby Davis versus Toffer Van Dorn, Barbagallo, the Australian V8s. Right. That was like bumper to bumper, I don't know, one hour, two hour race, whatever, 90 minutes. I don't give a shit. They were bumper to bumper. All the race, and Toby was trying to pass Toffer, and he couldn't do it. Like, 
that amazing that for me that's one of the most amazing races that i saw with not actual passing but the intensity that the commentators were putting it oh my god toby's gonna do it oh my god toby made a mistake oh stop made a mistake it's like holy shit man like first picture boom right let's have a look you might cut out there a little bit but you're you're back so i think we didn't miss anything so we're okay okay yeah I, this is this is a photo I've seen so many times because um, my dad put it on Facebook when I was yeah. when, when we first got Facebook back in the day, and uh, I know exactly where this is and I can tell you exactly what it is because I so this was my local sprint track which I was actually racing at just last weekend um, up in, in the yeah. Highlands. It's a twelve hour drive now for me to get up there, so I drove twelve hours to drive. I got one run in the end because our car broke down and then came back, but it was worth it. So this was my local racetrack. I was sitting. In the back seat, there was a spectator area up the top where you could sit on the bank and see the cars coming around. And I used to get a high chair put up for me in the back seat so that I could see out the windscreen. And when Dad was doing his racing and everyone was in the paddock and I found the noise of the cars way too loud and scary and terrifying, I could just sit in the car and, and watch everyone driving around the, 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 the track. And that was, for me, like, as you can see, I was very much enjoying it. Like, um, even there was a chap as well called Sandy Finlayson. Who, and he unfortunately had a stroke, and um, but he, he's he was back in the paddock again last weekend, which was incredible. Um, but he used to be like for me, it was the one car I looked forward to every time because he would get sideways a little bit, and he would get this Toyota <laughs> Starlet space frame with loads of power, and he would be drifting it. And I just remember getting so excited for his run to come along so I could watch it. And that was when I was like, I mean, how old was I there? I don't know, maybe three, four, not quite sure. But yeah, yeah, I can I can remember the feeling. That's for sure. I'm glad that you explained as I was thinking, man, I know for sure that they had better chances than that. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Do not worry. I did not go home like that. <laughs> okay. Like, you know, back in Romina, we didn't chance it. So, like, what the hell is that? No, just put your kid there and whatever. Next picture. Let's see. Okay, this is um, this was me in my first year of school because I had that... Um, tracksuit jacket I used to when I was a kid I loved like horribly um like horrible tracksuits that I would now look at and think not in a million years would I ever go near them but um yeah I used to wear them so that was definitely first year of school this was uh, one of my friends from home Holly and this was on a sports day so um we used to have those in school do you have sports days in school yeah yeah so it was just sitting over by the sports day with my very cool sunglasses that were just uh that had, that had no effect thinking I was very cool aged probably 12 or 13 or something like that but it wasn't that I mean that's only like I mean what 10 11 years ago now so unfortunately I was the kind of I was at the age where Facebook was a thing when I was that young and Facebook back in those days was different like nowadays young kids are like adults on Facebook they they're all mature and they try and but back in those days you know we would go on Facebook and we wouldn't private message anyone we would send messages on people's walls and write all sorts of stuff and I constantly see absolute nonsense in my memories of like conversations with my friends on our Facebook walls that you just think how we were just going public with that rubbish. But um, yeah, that's that's what that was. Okay, and now talking about the singing. Ah, yeah, so there's there's me looking very, um, I look quite bored actually on my uh, on my box. But yeah, this was this, this is my cajon. So this this is the drum I still have. And this is the one that's the coffee table in the living room. Um, but yeah, this was the, the Scottish Youth Cayley Band that I used to play for, that I talked about earlier, that I auditioned for. Um, so we always wore that same tie, black shirt. This was during one of our concerts. Um, this was before I was singing, I think, though. This was like one of my first few years with them. Because um, this was like teenage years, right? So I was going through puberty and I was changing quite a lot every year. So you can kind of tell what stage it was based on like how tall I was. And this was very much like middle of puberty um but yeah this was i yeah the, a massive thing for me in my life when i was that age i actually i almost went to a fully music school in my last year of school which would have completely changed my career and like probably would have taken me away from racing and music would have been my thing um i played with with a similar group we, we actually played the um junior proms at the albert hall so we went down to london we were the first scottish group ever um to be invited down to the royal albert hall to play at the junior proms so we were all school kids aged between like 13 and maybe 17 something like that and there's a group of 40 of us and we had this piece and we were doing it live on bbc and there was 
there was eight, you know, that hacked out Albert Hall and it was just the most incredible experience of my life. And I remember thinking like, wow, you know, like this was music was the thing at that point. And it was, yeah, I, we got some amazing opportunities when I was younger and also just met so many of my friends that I still uh, am close with now because of music. Like it completely opened up my community to, to lots of other people that I never would have met just through school. So no massive part of my life at that time. Doing the research and looking at your like all Facebook and I saw the story with, with your mom that raising everything like I was like proper detective uh, and <laughs> I look I was like what the hell is that I like started looking for, like singing on closet drawer sing like because oh, I, I couldn't tell what it is like I there's no description and it's like uh, anyway uh, I presume this is like a celebration when Chelsea won the championship. Because I know you're like a big fan of Chelsea. Oh, yeah, massive Chelsea fan, obviously. <laughs> no, uh, this this uh, is a music festival, local. So this is my high, a local Highland music festival. Very very cool teenage me going through my I'll wear any color of chinos phase. So blue trousers, that was fine, that was cool. Um, no, this was I think this was like the first time or the second time I'd ever been at a music festival. So yeah, having an amazing time. And there's actually some fantastic people in that photo as well. A lot, some of them I don't really still keep in touch with very much, but yeah, just stuff. Again, these are these are these are all of these things you're doing are actually really fun memories. Like honestly, they are they're good. And um, there's nothing special about this other than it was just a great time, a great festival with some really good friends. The the person not the furthest right. So there's a guy furthest right with um like a duck hat or something on. Okay. Um, and I only know him through that festival, but the girl who you could just see on the left of that, so you can just see her eyes and like um, doing the kind of rock hands. She okay. she is um, basically my best friend and has been since we were about 12. And um, so we still keep in touch a lot. And um, so yeah, so this was like that friend group, but yeah, that basically me and her have been, have been best mates since the very start of school. So since the start of Facebook days and those previous photos and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I don't know in which one you'll put or this one or the glasses one, but I'll I'll let the I'll let the people decide. <laughs> Boom. So this is so actually um so in Scotland, uh, we all wear kilts as I'm sure lots of stereotypes and people will know. Um, so and and we have a a specific tartan for depending on your family. So. I'm, my name's John Monroe, so they're, I for, therefore have the Monroe Tartan, and I know, like, they have clan chiefs and things like that, and that kind of, it's really, it makes dressing for fancy events really easy, right, because you just have a kilt and you wear it to everything, and it's your tartan. So the, the two guys beside me in this photo um, are, they're both also Monroes, but we're unrelated, so they were both in my year of school, um, but they're also Monroes, so this was just three Monroes at our final senior dance in school, um, or this might have actually been the, not my last dance, but the one before it, I can't quite tell. Um, second last year at school, maybe. But yeah, so there was all of us in our kind of similarly uh, kind of red mineral tart and kilts and stuff like that. So yeah, but all of us completely unrelated. Right, this is going to sound creepy as hell, but uh, holy shit. You only have two strings on your tartan and the other guys have three. Is that like... So, the, so f first of all, so my kilt is... Um, is a form of mineral tartan, but there are different variations within the same clan. So there is a darker red version of mineral tartan, um, and I think that might be what the chap on the left is, has got. I'm not sure. I, to be honest, I'm not sure if we all had. I, I don't know if they bought proper, if they're you know hiring kilts or if these were also mineral kilts from a different place. So they might be. They might even be more correct than mine. But um, yeah, there, there can be. There is variation. So even within mineral, as I say, you get slightly different styles, different shades, but it's kind of based on the same idea. Um, so, but I could not give you any details about the number of lines or anything. I might be the one who's got the wrong, got the wrong style, but, but yeah. Right. Cool. Let's see what's next. We're going to go on my, like, more serious stuff, more nice stuff, more presentable to you. Oh, there we go. I've actually, I've, I've enjoyed that. It's been good fun. It's been good fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was, um, so the, so the photo on the left, do you remember that uh, thing I was telling you about earlier where I yeah. won outright in my first ever event? So not, not the first one I did, but this, the first Scottish one I did. So I, I won my class in the first one, which was a British sprint championship one, which is the championship on the right in the news report. Um, but then I, I then won overall in my second ever event, which was my first Scottish event. And the photo on the left 
is from my final run on that day. So I, I actually, so you get four runs in Scottish sprinting and hill climbs. And I set the fastest time on the third run. And then on my fourth run, I had this massive drift where I touched the grass on entry to this corner and, and held this power slide and kept it. I mean, I didn't keep it on the road, but I kept it away from crashing, which was quite good. The video's on YouTube. I'll maybe get you to link it in the description below, the video of that very run. Um, but yeah, this was just, I love this photo because it's like a proper power slide, even though I didn't, I kind of, I saved it, but I still went on the grass, but this makes it look like I'm just styling out. So um, yeah, and you can see with my eyes, I was a little bit anxious. Because, of course, that's the first time I'd ever been sideways in a car. Because I didn't have a driving license either. So this was all very new to me. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the photo on the right. So I, I'd done the first British sprint round at Croft when I won my class at the start of the year. We then went and did uh, a round at Anglesey at the end of the year, me and my dad. And I became the youngest ever person to qualify for a British sprint championship runoff. Um, so... It meant a lot to me. This was actually the weekend that Jules Bianchi had his crash at Suzuka because I remember it being at the circuit and getting the news on my phone. Um, but this, yeah, this was a good, a good weekend, just learning a new track and being able to do something on the British scene, not just, you know, I was doing well in Scotland. I won the championship in Scotland. So to come to, to Britain with a car, and this car was only 1,000cc, so we weren't as quick as a lot of the F1 engine cars in the higher classes, and we shouldn't really have managed to be in the top 10, but I did manage to get in the top 10 and therefore became... Um, the youngest ever qualifier and then became the youngest ever point scorer um, and that's something like that's something I'm really proud of with racing to be honest because every like when I first did the Scottish thing I became when I won the first event on the left I became the youngest ever person to win a Scottish sprint championship event outright um, which was a record that I'd taken from a friend of mine Danny who'd won it a few years earlier but he'd actually taken that record from Sterling Moss so it was a it was a Sterling Moss record that was then uh, beaten by Danny because it was in the news at the time and then I came along a few years later a bit younger than he was and beat and won so um, and then I won this this um, record in the UK or later that year so I was the youngest in Britain and at that point I was I was trying to get all these records for being the youngest because I was still 16 so um, and then the next a couple of years later I I um, did the same thing in the hill climbs as well so I became the youngest person to qualify for a hill climb runoff in in Scotland I think I can't remember the I can't remember the um, what the specific thing were but I managed to be yeah. another thing so yeah that was something I can't do that anymore I can't be the youngest at anything anymore <laughs> but it was something I'm very proud of very, very nice. now we're gonna go with the, this oh top step so we've got so yeah this is I was racing for Airstream at the time so I think I'm the car on the right presumably and is that who have I crashed into it I see uh is that one of the ice cold racing variants behind so is that Yes, yes, it's the yeah. North Line variant. And on so the that's Vite or Strana. I'm not sure who's that off on the left, but it's a shark skin. Oh, it's Walk. It's you, is it? Is it me crashing into you? Yes. <laughs> not me. Because I didn't race in top step, but I had like, uh, I had a Rob Taplin, Lewis. Yeah. Rob's brilliant. I've, uh, I've, I've raced with Rob since then, recently, and he's, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. I love him to bits. So, yeah, that was me obviously crashing with someone else in your team. So, if it was my fault, I apologize. Yeah, definitely. Not that walk drivers were aggressive by any stage. Uh, Kilo, Sorensen, Lauritsen. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great league, though. That was fun. It was just a bit of, it was after Touring Pro Series, it kind of got a bit quiet, and we, we managed to have a bit of fun in that as well. This photo is Alton Park. So so when I, after the, the, the earlier photo of me becoming the youngest British qualifier, the next year we thought, right, I'm breaking all these records, let's go and try and see if I can make a career. So we went and raced in the UK and that's why we ended up in Mazdas because I thought I'm going to learn loads. If I race in single make MX-5s that have British touring car drivers coming in and competing, uh, Abby Eaton had won the championship the year before, it was very competitive um, and I thought there's no better way than to throw myself in the deep end and learn racecraft against like 29 other Mazdas. Um, so this was, <laughs> I'd gone down um, previously to test a car but um the guy who had organized it had told me i needed i just needed a race license whereas in actual fact it was a track day not a test day so i needed a road license which i didn't have because i was 16. so we went all the way to Alton park which was like 450 miles to be told i couldn't drive and then had to go home so that wasn't very good but then eventually in january i managed to pass my driving test after a complete nightmare trying to get it booked amongst the snow and everything and then a week later because i had my test i could go down and do my first track day which was in this MX-5, so 
we bought that car um, it became the white car with the orange and black stripe, which you might have seen if you were looking through some photos. Um, and that was my first ever day driving a Mazda, first ever day in a big circuit, not doing a sprint in the single seater. Uh, and my dad on the right looking very proud and happy as well. Um, so yeah, that was that was an amazing day. Like, I learned a heck of a lot as well. I realized how fast other people were on that day. Uh, let's go back to some serious stuff now. More serious. Oh, very serious. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> on the left, the first time I ever raced at Spa, amazing opportunity. Um, it was a one-off at the time with TWP, who I now race for full-time. They basically said, we've got a seat. We'd like you to come and drive for us. So I went and did that. Um, and unfortunately, the engine blew up as soon as my teammate got in the car and did his first. So I did oh. the first <laughs> half of the race, had fun. He went in one lap later, the engine blew. So we didn't finish, but I was delighted because I was at Spa. And as you can see, I was very, yeah. very happy indeed. Yeah. Uh, the photo on the right is a Halloween party where I am clearly climbing aboard Donald Trump. Um, I don't think anything else needs to be said about that, really. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the photo speaks for itself. And uh, yeah, Donald's yeah. looking better than he ever has done. Definitely. <laughs> ah, more recent. So, So this was uh, a photo taken when I was doing a traction live stream. So I was streaming with um, my friend Rich. We were doing a Lego stream. So we basically um, reached an agreement with Lego, which was ama it's amazing to work with brands like Lego and actually officially be doing stuff for them that they're promoting. It was amazing. So Lego had sent us this um, BMW bike that uh, we had to build. So Rich was going to build because I'm rubbish at building things. Um, and we thought, right, if why don't we do a challenge where, where um, and we pitched this to Lego. We said, Rich will build the bike live on a stream and we'll work out roughly how long Lego expect us him to take. So Lego told us all oh, we think he'll take about 10 hours. And I said, right, well, I will try and do uh, 10 hours worth of driving on, on a game and try and beat him. So essentially I was like, oh, I'll do, you know, 50 laps of the Nordschleife and 50 laps of Macau. I worked it out, so it should take roughly 10 hours. And we had a race to see who would win. So um, I managed to win the challenge. It ended up, I think I completed the challenge in about 10 and a half hours. And um, this was a photo taken just before we went live. Um, and Rich, uh, he finished building the bike after 11 hours and 45 minutes. So it was a very long stream. Uh, it was a very long day. All of our colleagues had left the building by that point. So we were just kind of in on our own. <laughs> but, um, but it was a load of fun. It was really, really good fun. And it was nice to like have some people watching the whole thing as well. So um, lots of people were very engaged. And I think that's a really nice photo because I feel like someone got a photo when I wasn't expecting it in that work environment, um, looking semi-serious. But um, yeah, it's great. We, we have photographers in traction that, that sometimes just take photos. Um, Cameron, who I work with, is amazing. And he will he'll get photos that you didn't know you wanted or didn't know you had. And you look at them and think, oh, that's that's such a good photo because I just look like I look like I'm enjoying myself and I'm in a work environment. And yeah, so I, I really like that. I'm going to up. P1 on that, I have a better. Oh no. Actual photo. Is it Donald Trump again? Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. So on the right, as you can see, I'm a princess because I, I was given a crown. I think that was my birthday and I was and I was given a crown. So there's not there's not much more to that one. Uh, the one on the left, uh, yeah, I look far better in that one than I do in the Lego one, don't I? Uh, this, <laughs> this was a video idea that I pitched and that I heavily regret, um, as you can see. But no, I basically I thought we should do a series where, you know, you know, in Facebook groups, people are always like, oh, whose fault is this? And then someone will go, oh, clearly the red card. And someone goes, no, what the red card was, it wasn't looking in the mirrors and the blue car had a right to the move. So I thought, let's do a series where I basically take people's videos where they try and work out who's at fault. And I give my opinion based on my experience in sim racing, try and have a bit of fun with it as well. And but just try and give my honest opinion on who I thought was at fault. So I, I kind of did a first draft and it was a bit serious and then we thought let's make it a bit more fun so i'll be a judge and um, so i bought a very nice wig and became judge and jury um and basically yeah just took some clips and, and did a we did a pilot episode it didn't do super well and i think it would we want to revisit it in the future to be honest but we want to get better clips for it so we haven't done an episode since simply because we've kind of been waiting for the format to work out a better format maybe a few of us on a sofa discussing the incident rather than just me sitting on my office desk with a green screen and a, and a wig. But yeah, that's where that photo's from. So um, not my 
yeah, not my not my best look to be honest. But actually, um, uh, like I see all the videos, but on that one, like uh, I really enjoyed, and I I I, I loved how you attack uh, attacked the problems like overlap or entry everything. So I enjoyed it a lot. So I don't know if you. Well, that's, oh, that's good. I'm really glad. I think I think people enjoyed it. Um, they're just it, it didn't obviously it wasn't hugely successful in terms of views, but I think those who watched it did enjoy it, and I think we do want to revisit it, but. It, it takes a little bit of effort because you can't just go like we were just grabbing you know p publicly posted videos that people had done but some of them had terrible audio some of them were filmed on a potato um it was it was tricky so if we do it in the future we want people to submit replay files and clips that are high quality and honestly there's just been so much else on it we haven't done it yet but it's on the agenda lots of other people have been doing it like jimmy broadbent did a video a month ago where he was like whose fault is it looking at drivers at fault and um, so other people have done it as well um but we will, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully revisit it. Talking about that, I have, uh, have, me, myself, and me with my team, we have raced in multiple, multiple communities and multiple, multiple sims. And I've seen a bunch of rules about mainly the overlap rule. And like, I come from race room. In race room, in theory, if uh, you're like exiting the corner, left, right, doesn't matter. And you have a car on the outside at the exit of the corner, and the car on the outside has like a bumper of overlap. Then I'm going to hang in out to dry. A bumper of, of overlap, like, no, shut the fuck up. I'm, you're off. Either you lift off or either you're in the grass. I don't care. I'm in the front wheel drive car. You're not going to spin me. I go to iRacing, and in iRacing, if you have like a millimeter of overlap or like if you see the car coming at a high rate of speed, you have to give him space. I'm like, what? And then there's another uh, thing that I don't understand is like, where should the overlap count on entry? Because I see a lot of uh, communities have, you should have, I don't know, half a car, three quarters, whatever the overlap is by the turning point. And I'm saying, well, if you're driving different cars and with different driving style, my turning point is different from yours. And also, if I know if that is the rule, I can be cheeky and turn in earlier. And I said, well, that's my turning point. What the hell do you want? And he's at fault. So I don't like that rule also. So my question too is like, what is your rule? Like in your mind, like the perfect, whatever. Overlapping. I, I, I struggle. So, I mean, this is why, like, this is why people always talk about it racing incidents and who's at fault and it's never clear because there are so many variables and people can bend the rules and you can't make hard rules because racing is racing every incident is slightly different and there's different you know scenarios i personally i look at an incident on, a, on an individual basis and i say has has each driver given the other one respect like fair enough you can definitely you can push it of course you can try and win the battle so you might do something clever you might try and force someone out but for me like I, I and maybe this is my downside. I tend to be more on the lenient side. Like if I, if I had someone with a bumper alongside me on exit, I would be like, mm, I'm not gonna. I don't want to cause a crash. I'll leave them the room, and I might lose the position because of it. Um, but if I was just ahead and I could, then I would come across. Or or if I was maybe mid corner and they and they only had a bumper, then I would I would I would show them that I was gonna squeeze them out. Like I wouldn't squeeze them out if we were right at the edge and they were there. But I would. I would put them in a position mid corner where I'm like, I'm going to squeeze you out, so back off, and then they will might back off. But if they don't back off and they're still there, maybe I have to leave them room. It's tricky. But I, I think a big thing, the photo you you showed earlier, the Mazda, like when I was racing that first season of MX fives, my biggest downside was I was too nice. Like, I, I was too respectful. I, I was too scared. I didn't want to damage the car. Also, and I, and I got taken advantage of. So I, I was fourth every single practice session every like i was always top five pace and then qualifying uh, maybe be a little bit lower but sometimes you know top five and i would just drop in the race because someone goes in the inside i'll leave them room but then they but then the next person the opposite happens i don't get left room they squeeze me off i'm on the grass someone crashes into me i get involved in pileups they're not my fault it it was constant so it, it's a balance and i'm maybe not the best person to say what's right or wrong because i am too nice i think sometimes with it but I tend to think, like, if you're having a fun race, if there's nothing at stake, keep it that way. You know, have let the person have an overlap and let them pass you again, because then you can just make another move on them. Like, I really enjoy fun racing where there's a bit of respect there. But if it's something more serious, I'll, you know, I'll get my elbows out a little bit more. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm racing for serious. So I don't like what hard. What is that? No, I don't care. Your like, elbows are beyond the camera. Yeah, yeah. You know, but as I said, uh, for a different guy, like, and all of my team knows, I replace adrenaline from real life with sim racing. Yeah. So for me, I'm I'm not doing sim racing because I want to be a real life guy. But like, of course, somebody is gonna give me millions, sure. But otherwise, I love sim racing. That's my objective. That's my goal with the team and myself. So, and also like I need the jolt because in real life I cannot have it anymore or I have it, but it's in a truck and how much jolt can you get from a truck? So I need that. I'm like racing for to get the jolt. And if I'm nice, I'm not getting any jolt. So I'm like, everybody's passing. No, fuck that shit. No, dive bomb. Like for me and the guys uh, in my team know like in the race room, in front wheel drive cars, and uh, yeah, I know I have a niche within a niche within a niche, but it's me there, like half a second dive bomb, that's very doable, if not a problem. Even seven tenths, depends, like how you take the intent. I can do seven tenths. And then you come by racing, and you're like, bomb from two tenths, everybody's like flipping, oh my God, you dive bomb, they're like, that's two tenths, what the hell are you talking about? And you're like, two seconds of a pace. Okay, so I have a quick fire now. So, favorite color? Uh, bright, luminous green. Okay. Uh, favorite sweet? Favorite sweet? Um, wine gums. Are you lazy? Yes. Cats or dogs? Cats or dogs? Dogs. Uh, nickname? Don't have one, I would say. Weirdest thing you have eaten? Weirdest thing I've eaten? Oh. Boring answers like snails and stuff. Um, yeah, not sure. Not, I don't, I, nothing majorly weird. Right. Nude beach, yes or no? No. Uh, warm weather or cold weather? Warm weather. Just a mustache. Would would you like to like just a mustache? No. What's the most boring thing ever? Cricket. I think that's a lie. Actually, that's that's not true. Shopping. I would probably enjoy so cricket if I sat down and learned it. Shopping. We'll go shopping. I can't be arsed with shopping. I get so. Like I, I, my, when I go shopping, I'm uh, sorry, this is quick fire. I appreciate this, but this needs to be said. When I go shopping, I need to get the things I want to get and leave because there's no point wasting my life in a shop. But some people really enjoy going around slowly and going down every aisle and picking everything out. And for me, I'm like, that's half an hour. I could be watching a race or doing something that's not shopping. So shopping hundred percent. It's called being a man. Mostly. <laughs> my dad's bad. My dad takes ages in the shop. I'm actually my mum that's like me. So me when we're shopping, my girlfriend and my dad, they'll take an hour and a half happily. Me and my mum straight to the till, do everything fast. Yes. Yeah. I'm like in the department because, uh, like, if I do like regular shopping when I come home, my wife wants to be alone because she stays with the kids all the time. So I take the kids and I fly through the shop and then we do something else. And but when I go with my wife, yes, it's a little bit a lot slower. A uh, controversial answer to that question, actually, reverting. Um, I really cannot be bothered with like wrestling or fighting or like oh, okay. um, boxing. I I have no. I, I love sport, and I, that's, that's why I wasn't sure. You know, cricket I would enjoy if I learned the rules. I love sport. I love watching sport: golf, tennis, football, racing. But I cannot in any way be bothered with like martial arts or with boxing or or fight. I just it doesn't do it for me at all. I get none of the interest from it. I wouldn't I would be paid to watch it, but I definitely wouldn't watch it for free or let alone pay for it. Okay, I, I get it. I am so kind in that boat, but a little bit. Not so I like I watch all kinds of sports if I have time, but MMA fighting box is like towards the very back end. Anyway. Coming towards the end now, because oh my god, we're talking for a little bit. Is your thing like is your life all of it uh, around motorsport racing, sim racing, job, or whatever? Or do you have like okay, I'm gonna go with the lads out and have some proper fun? Um, somewhere in the middle. I, I, because I have a big passion for motorsport and I'm involved in it 
at home and uh, with real racing, I'd say a lot of my hobbies and a lot of my extra interests do involve motorsport in some way. So um, I'm not I'm not a, like a laddie lad at all. I, I'm not big. I, I do enjoy like the odd going out um, to a pub and catching up with friends. I really enjoy that socialising in that way. But I'm, I don't have like a, and I've never been like, uh, I've never gone on, like a big lads holiday or uh, been part of like a, a friend group of males. I've always I've always mixed with male and female, and that so so therefore there's a lot of people like the kind of a lot of regular things that people do and the kind of normal way of living when you're from the UK. I kind of tend to be more introverted and quiet, and I would rather have a great community of friends through like sim racing and through music, playing music together, going to music sessions, doing stuff like that. Um, so definitely like that kind of thing. But I would say you know even though a lot of my passion involves around motorsport and a lot of my weekends involve motorsport, I still, I definitely make sure I find time for everything else. Like I, as I say, as you know, I haven't done any sim racing really outside of work. Um, because I do so much in work, I don't want to spend, especially for my partner as well, I don't want to spend my whole evenings on my PC doing the same thing or doing sim racing. I want to try and do other things. So I'll, I will fully go away and, and try and join in with other stuff and do other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, some somewhere in the middle. Quite a boring answer, but yeah, I'm not I'm not extreme either way. I'm I'm very passionate, very busy with motorsport. Like talking a lot about motorsport, as you can probably tell. But um, but yeah, definitely keep keep space for other things. Don't get burnt out with it. Okay, and the uh, last serious question: Should sim racing merge with the real life motorsport, or should they be like in like they're like similar but completely parallel lines? I think they need to be parallel and because they're just very different things. I think sim racing is a fun way of an accessible way of, of, of competing in motorsport and getting the fun of a good race and, and also just the fun of the community and everything like that. But they are very different and real motorsport is all about the money and all about, you know, it's, it's, it's just a different thing. So there definitely should be crossover. And I, and I love that people, because people who are interested in sim racing are probably interested in it because they like cars and racing. So therefore, you know, there should always be crossover. And I think those lines are becoming way more blurred, by the way. I think, who, how do you define someone as a sim racer anymore? If someone's 18 and they go into real life racing, oh, they were a sim racer. Yeah, but who wasn't a sim racer these days? You know, like kids, yeah. if kids are into racing, they're all going to be sim racers. And you get older, touring, you know, some real life racers have done more sim racing. Like look at Mike Epps, for example. He's big on sims, but he was he's a real life racer first. So where do I stand on that? I used to be a sim racer, then I started real life racing and suddenly I was the real life racer doing sim racing. But actually, I was a sim racer first. I was a sim racer doing real life. So yes, the, the, the lines are very blurred, but they're, they're two different things and they need to be considered as two different things. And I think there, sh there shouldn't be some sort of competition over which is best. They should just, you know, they should both be enjoyed as different forms of motorsport, but, but entirely different. Right, I agree with that. Different, some blurring, but different. Anyway, last uh, few questions. Do you have any uh, regrets? No. Like, uh, no. No, quite simply, I, I, I love what I get to do all the time, and I don't, yeah, there's nothing, there's no specific time I think, oh, I just wish I'd done that, or wish I'd done that. Um, I never pushed for sponsors in real racing, and I don't regret not doing it, because I think if you start doing that, you're you're never going to stop, and and I don't want to go begging people for to give me money for something if I don't feel like what I can provide them is worth it to them. You know, if I'm if I'm racing in a small series, I don't want to lie about it and and say, oh, you're going to get so much out of this if I don't think you are. I'd rather just race on my own terms, do something sustainable. So, so yeah, that's a long unnecessary bit of extra story, but no, you, I don't regret anything. Right uh, now, you have to name three races, uh, real life. Uh, sim racing as a driver and sim racing as a commentator because you've done plenty of both mm -hmm. that when somebody asks you hey what's sim racing like like a driver that's like the first race that comes either that you did or either that one that you saw like the, your example was that the one with the clear maybe you have a different one that uh, you know so so a different different clear race but yeah um so the first season of clear as i did which is the one you, we talked about we were both in season three i think the last round was at a fictional circuit called old ring and I still, at this point, hadn't won a race on Touring Pro Series, so I was going for a win. Um, and the commentary team were desperate for me to get my win as well. And I'll never forget it because the, the, it was a two-race event and the championship had been decided. And it was more just like, okay, so my me going for my first win became a bit of a narrative because I had the pace. And I was second behind Ryan Cal in the whole race. Um, in hindsight, 
okay, I do regret something. I shouldn't have kept on making the same moves. Um, but I kept trying to pass him in the same ways and he, he knew what I was doing and we, we got into a rhythm. I made a mistake. He won. But race two, um, one of the best races I've ever been involved with. And it was me versus, I was for MTR at the time. I think it was me versus three THR cars or maybe two THR cars and Chris Hack, actually, um, when he was still racing in the, the pink mobile. Um, so there, and there was a, it was a four car battle for the whole second race. I was desperate for my first ever win. I made some amazing moves. Uh, the others made some amazing moves. There was contact, drama, commentary were going mad. Um, I didn't win the race, spoiler alert, but I'll never forget it because it, it felt like I, I felt like I was part of this big story and I was trying so hard to win. And it was an incredible race. Like the Cleos were so good for battling and you were just changing positions all the time, bump drafting, outside lockups, making the move sideways. It was it was amazing. And if I could find that on YouTube, it probably is there. I would just I would go back and watch the whole thing because it was just epic. And that's the one that always stands out to me, just brilliant. As a racer, not commentary. Right, commentary, um, probably being the lead commentator in the British Hill Climb Championship when it came to Dune, just because of the prestigiousness of the event and the fact that, you know, I've been given the opportunity to do this and I was able to commentate on some incredible, like, record-breaking runs in their classes and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, basically being able to, to lead a team on in real-life motorsport commentary from commentating on Sims and everyone was really happy with how I did. And that was a big moment for me just because of the prestigiousness of it all. Um, and real racing, I'd say probably Race of Remembrance in 2019. Um, so the Race of Remembrance is, you might have, I don't know if you've heard of that at all. I it's, saw it on uh, the post. Yeah, so it's a char it's, it's a race basically on Rem uh, Remembrance Weekend. Um, and it's for mission organized by Mission Motorsport, who is which one of the founders of is now my team manager at TWP. But um, it's basically for for veterans who have been damaged by war, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, and it's it's all about you know having a great race, being together on Remembrance Weekend, uh, and the, the you know cars of all kinds race. But at the end of the day, the, the racing stops in the morning for a service, um, and it's really nice. And I I have I, I've got no connections to. The military or anything like that but it's but it's seeing so many of people how much it means to them it's amazing and the whole event because of the aura around it is really special and in 2019 uh, after years of unreliability and just enjoying the event but not doing a good job in the race we had an incredible run like we it was raining and our, our mazda that i'd raced in club endure was so good in the wet and we we led our class but we also ended up leading overall um throughout the night which was uh, against you know cars way way quicker cars caterums and lotus exiges and stuff and we were in our mazda that was class d you know the fourth class fastest class and we were leading outright and um everything was perfect the race the, the race dried up the next day so we didn't win overall but we did win our class in the end which was amazing so i'd say that was probably the ultimate weekend where my driving was perfect the the car was perfect the team was perfect we won together so there was lots of people that it really mattered to and it meant a lot to so being part of that you know it's i can imagine to a completely different scale what it's like winning a race like le mans or winning in your class when everyone in the team is just so proud of what everyone else has done and you can come together i would say it was a similar feeling on a totally different scale for that and i had a lot of my family there as well so that's the one that stands out like the perfect race weekend it's going to be hard to ever top that in terms of just how how brilliantly it all went okay awesome uh, what people do not know about John Mongo, well, plenty, but like, uh, I don't know, fears, phobias, like quirks or like... Um, I, maybe I'm, I'm someone who's always been quite introverted and quite anxious. So maybe because I do YouTube videos, people might think I'm quite a confident person and quite, a, you know, extroverted and all these things. But I'm, I always describe, I would say I'm, I'm an outgoing introvert with anxiety. So, so I have an outgoing personality, but I'm actually quite a quiet person. I like, so I'm not, you know, I hate confrontation more than anything. Um, I'm not someone who's going to go and I hate being center of attention. So I really struggle sometimes with, with certain things in videos. Um, but because of, because I love racing and because I'm like, I've got quite a, as I say, outgoing personality, um, that's maybe something that people might not kind of know. So I guess if you know me, you know exactly what I'm like, but, um, to those looking in uh, videos and stuff like that is probably probably something you, you wouldn't you i may be quite hard to read i guess maybe you wouldn't really know what to expect if you met me in real life but um yeah i'm, I'm fairly similar to what i'm like in videos right 
And the last question is driver excuses, be it sim or real life. Best best excuses or best drive driver excuses, the one that you use, like in sim or in real life. Oh, um, well, for real life, it's for years. It's for the last few years, it's been straight line speed, and it's and it's an excuse. It's a true excuse, but it's an excuse nonetheless. And I hate talking about it because it's a genuine reason why we're struggling through a problem that we've got, not just a lack of performance. It's like, you know, we have something wrong with the car. Um, but I hate being the one to say, oh, we didn't win because we were slow in straights because of a problem. So that's definitely one. A lack of practice is a big one. Sim racing all the time. Oh, I just didn't put enough hours in. I didn't have time. I, you know, I was rushing. So I was delighted to even be only a second off the pace. Lack of practice, big one. Um, that's, that's probably the big two, to be honest. I use that one a lot. I use that. I, I use it more than I realize, and it's and it's just because it's an easy win, isn't it? If you're struggling a little bit, well, they probably practice more than me. Setup as well. I'm useless at car setups, so I will use that as an excuse. I can't. I can't adapt to setup to save my life. So, um, so yeah, blame the setup, blame lack of practice. But at the end of the day, it's all just lack of talent. Right. Okay. Well, John, uh, I had a blast. Very, very enjoyable. I hope you did too. Yeah, it was it was super. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, good luck to you in everything you do. Thank you very much. Cheers. Oh, I like your um, I like your artwork. Yes, yeah, that's cool. It's very cool. Oh, okay, I was thinking about the other one is the kids. Oh, I have nice. also. You seen Bolt? Bolt Schumacher. Good combo, and Monza. <laughs> nice, <laughs> historic Monza as well. <laughs>